Hey, Bear. Hey, Bear. Bear's gonna take what he wants if he wants it. Bulls and bears. It's crazy out there. My whole entire elk hunting career boiled down to one moment on a super monster. Can we pack on these ponies before they quit on us? Can you like go crossways? When I think of the perfect elk hunt, I think bow hunting, September, I think backcountry, ruggedness, grizzly bears, just the wildest country that doesn't see much for human traffic. And this is exactly what that hunt was. Just me and my buddy Joe headed from the trailhead on our horses into the unknown. Got the horses all wound up. Bear came by camp. We'd hardly been here, already got bears crawling all over camp. Hopefully the big thing is that these horses don't get too squirrely and then blow through the fence and head back to the trailhead. That'd be bad. That's why I tie them to a tree. We got them tied up and let them calm down a little bit. If guys just let me catch you, we'd be going. Oh, oh. oh. We got some frost. Yeah, a little bit. Super bright. We had a bull beagle by the tent here. And he was working out that way. So we're gonna go check out down over the lip here and do some location bugles and see if we can't find him and then just probably post up for a while and head that way and just glass and look and bugle. See if we can't catch a bull cruising. They're just starting to cruise and look for cows, so it's good timing. I expected the first couple days of this hunt to be pretty slow just because of the weather. Highs in the low 70s, full moon at night, it was smoky, it just didn't feel like normal elk hunting weather. Uh, this was a little bit different type of country that I was hunting that I'm not used to hunting, whereas in its, its very high and rolly terrain, a lot of green timber, there's a lot of rocks and rock outcropping. I just don't really see much of that type of country where I normally hunt. This is totally new up here for me. And so I knew I had to hunt this differently.
with the green timber, there wasn't much for glassing. And so I knew I was going to have to rely on calling and hunting the topography. Uh, hunting the topography, meaning that I had to be careful where I was going to call from and call to and using the crest of the hills and the drainages as cover, essentially. Calling in a big mature bull is very difficult when you're by yourself and you don't have a caller with you. You have to be very, very calculated with when to call, how you call, and how many times you call. So right after I let out that first bugle, I actually bumped a grizzly bear right below me. I thought it might have been a bull. I didn't know what was going on, but I heard this crashing. And I bumped this grizzly bear out from right below me and it ran down across the basin and out of sight. And then he actually looped up around and came across the wide open again uh, shortly thereafter, but pretty crazy. Shortly after that, a bull responded. I couldn't believe it. It was mid-morning, the sun was getting high. You just don't expect to really hear much. I planned on sitting at this spot probably most of the day and just listening, but a bull responded. Super exciting, I couldn't believe it. So I spent the next 30 to 45 minutes like really feeling out his temperament. I wanted to see how aggressive he was, how aggressive he sounded, and if I could get him worked up even more and possibly get him to come over to me. For me to expect a bull to come from a long distance and come all the way over to me is pretty rare, but as time showed, this bull made his way over to me, slowly wandering through the green timber, and he would bugle every 10 minutes or so. Now this can play mind games on you as well because you're, you start to think to yourself like, oh, maybe I should go after her. Maybe I need to move down in there. Maybe he's not going to come. He's been quiet for 10, 12, 15 minutes. And so that's when I want to beagle to him and, and talk to him and let him know I'm still here and I need a response from him. Now, when I would do that and I would beagle to him, he would usually bugle back to me, whether it was a chuckle or just that piping, bull calling cows bugle. You could just tell his sense of urgency. I knew he wanted to come size me up. I knew he wanted to check out and see what was making all this elk sounds of ruckus back behind me that I was trying to imitate. I was right on the top of this 20 foot cliff. It was almost like a natural rim. And I knew that was a great natural barrier and the barrier that I needed to have in between me and the bull when I was calling. I knew that that bull was going to have to crest up that rim and he's gonna to wanna to come up on top and look and see exactly where that calling is coming from. They can't help it. If a bull can see exactly where the, the calling is coming from and they don't see an elk, or they don't hear an elk, they're going to leave. And so the goal here was, 
was to intercept him and encounter him before he could see exactly where that bugle and those calls were coming from. So I did not want to move. I knew I had to stay put. I needed to wait it out. As I made my way over the cliff edge where that bull had just chuckled, he was right below me. He was actually closer than I thought. I thought he was 50, 60 yards out from the rim. He was actually 20 or 30 yards. So as I crest over, I think he saw me because before I could even see what happened, he had bumped out and there was too much green timber there to really tell what happened. But he bumped out. I gave him a couple of those calf calls and he hung up. If he was to smell me, he would have been gone. That encounter would have been over and done with. And that's that. But he hung around because he still wanted to believe there was elk up there and he hadn't got to see where that calling had come from yet.
bull came from over a mile away. He was way over on this other ridge. Came from so far. Shot him right here, guys. Right here. And he went. He went 24 yards. <laughs> Boone and Crockett Bowl, 24 yards. We got beams for days, beams for days. I've dreamt about a bull like this my entire life. I don't even, oh, he's so beautiful. Oh, I'm so thankful. Oh, thank you, buddy. Thank you, buddy. Look at those beams. Look at those beams. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, guys. Unreal. I just, this is a, a specimen. Look at that second. I mean, just as gorgeous as it gets. He chipped this one off, it looks like. It's like his third on this side. Just look at his head. Look at his head. Thank you, Joe, behind the camera. He follows me on these ridiculous adventures. We've seen four grizzly bears already. We've been here one day. One day, grizzly bear in camp, two grizzly bears this morning. I thought it was two, I think it was one, but we saw the same one, I believe, twice. This is just like one of those old monarchs that he's lived through so much, grizzly bears and wolves, just the high country, the brutal winters. Oh man, what a beautiful bull. Look at this entrance. So I hit a little bit of scapula right there. Uh, barely clipped the scapula with that hybrid, but I got the power to do it. I got the power to do it. Ideally, I should have been about right here, but I just barely clipped that scapula. Maybe not, maybe that's just a rib. It's close though, but it just pounded into the front of his lungs, double lunged him 25 yards and down. Holy smokes, I don't even know what to say. This is a bull of my dreams. I've never seen beams this long, especially on the back end. Uh, completely just a massive giant bull. So thankful to be up here, to be able to hunt these. Thank the Lord for physical health and the drive to do this. Going into unknown country, a lump in your throat and hoping for the best. When I skin, I want to stay close to the hide and keep the meat off the hide, even this thin meat right here. This goes 
all the way down. We're just following this ridge bone. Look at this. Match cut. That's all it is. All right. So that is the back strap and a big chunk of neck meat. Couldn't get you some of that. That's like a 20 pound co salmon right there. 25 pounds maybe. We got the back strap. This is a Cryptek base layer inside out. It's black, so hopefully it won't show too much. I forgot my other game bag at camp because I packed all my food in it. And so I'm having to make do. So we got one back strap down one sleeve of the shirt from the bottom with the neck zipped up. And we'll do the other one on the other side. Ultimately, the flies are off this. We get it back to camp and we can put it in a real game bag, but that worked perfect. There's always a solution to a problem. For me, taxidermy is much more than just showing off inches of antlers. Uh, it's about the memory, it's about the experience, it's about the encounter. And so I wanted to capture that first moment when that bull looked around and came around that green timber and looked up at me and really revealed how good this bull was at the time. Just talk about my heart dropping in my stomach when I saw him turn and go around that big tree. When I'm 80 years old and I can't do this anymore and I can have this memory of the video and the taxidermy of the encounter that I had with this old eight and a half year old bull and that's why I had this bull done and I think Donnie at Cedar Mountain did an excellent job capturing the memory, the look, and the moment of that first look of this bull. Get the side back on there. Oh, you poor horses. Actually, I don't feel sorry for you. You weigh like 1,200 pounds. I only weigh 165 pounds. And this thing is at least half my weight. And this is like a tenth of a horse's body weight. So, my refined comment is, I don't feel sorry for the horses. That's what they're here for. They love working. They love packing meat. The end, fair and square. All right, that's what I love about this mainframe. Three horizontal straps and you're off to the races. It's awesome. Check this out. We had this extra counter assault uh, bear fence and we don't have any really good meat pulls up here. We're way spiked out. So we're gonna try this. It's just one night. We got everything on the ground. Some logs keeping the meat up off the ground. It's laid out so it can cool down. And we're a grizzly bear's arm length from being able to grab anything. So we're gonna get the juice hooked up to this. See what happens. I think it's gonna work. It's one night. Odds of bear finding your kill in one night are fairly slim, I feel like. I mean, it's always possible, but they got a carcass up there. They have another carcass buddies in here hunting. A few days ago, killed a bull. I think there's lots of pickings around. So we'll see. See in the morning what happens. Hey bear. Hey bear. Hey bear. 
Hey bear. Hey bear. Hey bear. Hey bear. Hey bear. Hey bear. Hey bear. Bear got into the fence, didn't work. You gotta be kidding me. Took a hind quarter. Hey, bear. Look at that. Eat out that. Bear's gonna take what he wants if he wants it. Bear fence did not work. I guess black ovus bags aren't grizzly bear proof. <laughs> but look at the drag mark. It was just right up there in the timber. He made a couple trips, it looks like, where he's facing rearward and dragging the meat. Took it right over this log. It's probably where the bag ripped. See some mud. And right over. Oh, look at that. There's some meat. Little devil. Might need help lifting it that high. Oh. Okay, right there. 